appreciate everyone coming on uh, this webinar as we learn together how to um, improve our the care of the patients that we treat with various spinal pathologies. Next slide, please. Not advancing. So I'm going to talk specifically about the unit um, ASI technology for use in adult spine deformity surgery. My disclosures. So in the unit uh, AI platform, again, plans, executes, and then analyzes your cases in the sagittal plane. And we refer to this as an ASI or adaptive spine intelligence platform. And you'll kind of understand that as I go through these slides, how uh, this basically is a very intuitive platform that helps you uh, uh, not only currently, but in the future, get better at doing uh, spinal reconstructive surgery. So again, there's a, a very nice concierge service with engineers that help simulate your surgical strategy in the sagittal plane. And this is powered by AI um, uh, methodologies that uh, estimates not only the uh, in, um, correction you're going to obtain in the region of the spine that you're uh, uh, fixing, uh, but also helps predict what the spontaneous correction of the spine, especially above and the thoracic region is going to uh, uh, occur uh, during the um, correction uh, down below. So very, very unique technology that again being applied to this uh, platform that uh, again also involves patient specific implants that are customized to the surgical case plan that you, uh, that you want to develop. So the predictive modeling again is a really unique platform of this that uh, when you've uh, correct the instrumented and fused region of the spine that this technology will allow to predict what's going to happen again to the unfused area, especially above in the thoracic region, uh, which is obviously very important to try and minimize adjacent segment disease and uh, specifically PJK and PJF, which are still very common problems associated with spinal reconstructive surgery, especially when the instrumentation and fusion extends to the sacrum and pelvis. There's also a very uh, uh, nice positive feedback loop that basically this technology aggregates the platform's capabilities to the seven step process that creates a, a iterative virtuous uh, cycle such that basically through image analysis and case simulation, uh, again, the implants are created, uh, the case is then supported and uh, um, uh, 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 treated, and then the data is collected uh, uh, post hoc and then applied into a machine learning, learning algorithm that helps you predict future uh, cases uh, with similar pathology. In other words, uh, it also uh, understands exactly the type of uh, um, uh, realignment that you typically obtain, whether you're using uh, posterior osteotomies, inner bodies, anterior techniques, uh, lateral techniques. It basically, uh, through um, this process, will understand uh, exactly what your typical realignments are in various regions of the spine with the techniques you're using and then apply that more precisely into your future cases so the uh, so that it gets even better uh, predicting exactly what you're going to obtain uh, during your surgical treatment. So very unique um, uh, um, process here. Again, there's a, a very nice user interface that again compares your pre-op um, x-rays, your plan and post-op images, and then uh, also uh, provides um, parameters for your patients to understand uh, exactly where you're falling for your various sagittal um, uh, alignment targets, your PILL, your TPA, uh, your pelvic tilt, things like that, basically. And so you understand exactly whether you've met your target, your goals, and then uh, these are all produced uh, for you in advanced analytics uh, and then a platform that you can easily see and, and uh, study if you'd like. And just to show, again, a very simple uh, analysis how this uh, adaptive spine intelligence platform can help uh, help you in your uh, surgeries in the future. Uh, in an ISSG study, uh, there was a reduced incidence of rod fracture in adult deformity cases. Uh, uh, basically, uh, once the unit patient-specific rod data platform was being utilized, you see 9% uh, uh, rod fracture in cases before a uh, unit uh, was being used, uh, decreasing 2.2% after. And these were the same surgeons doing these cases. Uh, similarly, again, in PSO cases, uh, rod fracture rates decreasing from 22% to 4.7%. Uh, really, the only major change, again, was the use of this uh, 
unit platform and, and the patient specific rod. So again, small studies, but just uh, I think an inkling of the future, how this technology is going to help us uh, get better what we do, not only in short term, but also long term uh, success and outcomes of these uh, of these procedures. So I want to highlight uh, basically actually it's going to be three. I cut one out just for time purposes. Three uh, adult spine deformity cases where I use this unit technology to, um, uh, I think, do a better job uh, uh, in my deformity cases. And we'll start off kind of a very straightforward case, a young adult idiopathic thoracic scoliosis patient. Uh, here's, uh, again, the coronal plane. See a 31 degree proximal thoracic, 56 degree main thoracic, and 41 degree uh, lumbar deformity with a thoracic hypokyphosis of, of 17 degrees. So I'm going to do a selective thoracic fusion here. I want to improve uh, 3D correction of the thoracic region and improve thoracic kyphosis. So here's the pre-op plan. So all the, basically this is what you're given. You're given the pre-op uh, measurements and then uh, uh, a plan that you can obviously alter. And here basically uh, my pre-op thoracic kyphosis from T4 to T12 was measured at 17 degrees and I wanted it to be 36 degrees. That was my plan. So rod's going to be created to be able to produce uh, additional 19 degrees of thoracic kyphosis. Uh, with a few uh, posterior column osteotomies, also loosening up the posterior spine. Uh, and again, with uh, knowing that there's only going to be a little bit of a give in the rod, I'm actually going to have a rod created that has a little bit more kyphosis than 36 degrees because we'll lose a little kyphosis, even though it's a 6.0 millimeter cobalt compressed rod, we're still going to lose a little bit. So we're going to probably have a rod around 42, 45 degrees of kyphosis to end up with 36 degrees. So here's the pre-op planning. The rod is simulated. And again, I, uh, this to me is one of the best features. Uh, uh, even though obviously I've been doing deformity surgery for 30 years now, I still like seeing exactly what the reconstructed sagittal plane is going to be uh, uh, on this image. Not only of the again, instrument region, but the spontaneous correction expected in the lumbar region below here. Uh, again, a very nice uh, quick, uh, pictorial of uh, what we're trying to accomplish in the sagittal plane in this patient. So here's the pre-op and uh, uh, planned um, uh, post-op images side by side. And I, my quote below is, why wouldn't every spinal deformity surgeon want to see this plan pre-op? I, I see no downside to taking a quick look at this and planning exactly what you want to accomplish in the sagittal plane in your patient. We know the sagittal plane well, realignment post-op is so important. So here's my uh, uh, pre and post-op radiographs in the coronal and sagittal plane. Uh, you see based in the coronal plane, obviously, I uh, uh, corrected the, uh, have a nice spontaneous correction of the lumbar, unfused lumbar curve below. And in the sagittal plane, you see I've corrected from 17 uh, degrees to 35 degrees of uh, sagittal kyphosis. And again, my plan was 36 degrees. So uh, uh, pretty darn close within measurement or certainly what I want to accomplish in the sagittal thoracic kyphosis production in this patient. And here's a, uh, a, a, um, a composite of, again, of the pre-op a planned uh, intra-op and post-op alignment uh, obtained in this patient. Again, here's the again a, 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 the chronological summary of how this is all um, uh, uh, planned out for you and then provided for you uh, in this uh, concierge service. It's a little more complicated case. The second case is degenerative lumbar scoliosis. We'll go down now to the bottom of the spine. Patient that has uh, this, these presenting x-rays are coronal plane uh, scoliosis. You see with subluxations and a lot of angulation of the lower part of the lumbar lumbosacral region. You see a very un, um, regionally malaligned sagittal plane, 14 degrees of thoracic kyphosis, only six degrees of lumbar lordosis, about a 40 degree uh, uh, pelvic incidence. So here are the pre-op uh, x-ray on the left and the planned execution on the left. Uh, you see obviously the um, uh, uh, rod is planned and I'm gonna do a few uh, posterior column osteotomy, some inner body fusions after I do decompressions at the bottom. So here we're going to see the uh, pre-op plan, not only of the instrumented region in T10 to St. William, but again, the expected spontaneous kyphosis above that's going to occur uh, following the uh, correction of the uh, thoracolumbar lumbar to sacral region during the surgery. So again, the left is the pre-op uh, radiographic plan, and the right is uh, kind of a, a 3D plan of uh, the spine pre-op, uh, the spine uh, plan post-op, and the rod uh, that's going to be uh, provided uh, in a patient-specific contour for the, from the thoracolumbar region all the way down to the lumbosacral region. Numerically, here's the pre-op plan uh, uh, sagittal alignment data on the left, and the, uh, what my plan is on the right. Obviously, things like uh, pelvic incidence is not going to change. 
uh, sickle slope you see is going to increase. Obviously, we want to markedly increase normal lordosis from minus six to minus 41 degrees, more, be more in line with the pelvic incidence. Obviously, we're going to have spontaneous increase in thoracic kyphosis above that. Uh, to keep everything harmonized. And here we predict from 14 to 38 degrees of spontaneous thoracic kyphosis. I mean, that's where the predictive modeling comes in. That's what they're predicting the ultimate TK is going to be after we correct the uh, lumbar lordosis to minus 41 degrees. So here's the operative correction radiographically. You see in the coronal plane with three inner body fusions. I think I did uh, post trachonal osteotomies from L2 to sacrum. We're going to see with the three T lifts at 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 1. Uh, you see my sagittal plane realignment, uh, minus 40 degrees of uh, lumbar lordosis, minus uh, plus 36 degrees of TK. And again, what, we, what was our plan? Again, we planned uh, 38 degrees of spontaneous correction of thoracic hyphosis, that ended up being 36 degrees. We planned minus 41, we got minus 40. So very, very close again with the measurement error of both the instrumented correction of the lumbar lordosis and the spontaneous uh, um, thoracic hyphosis correction above. Uh, that was planned and executed uh, uh, and was predicted by the um, uh, adaptive spine intelligence. Next, the severe thoracic hyperkyphosis, a more complicated case. So here's an older patient with osteoporosis and you see multiple um, compression fractures and previous vertebral plastics on 102 degree fixed thoracic kyphosis. Very rigid, you see 92 degrees on hyperextension. See MRI and CT shows a multiple collapsed people body in a very severe osteoporosis. So we're going to need to do a lot. We see a very long construct here. And I'm going to plan a VCR at the apex to help with the uh, uh, correction uh, in this patient. So then here's our uh, numerical pre-op plan, uh, uh, pre-op and then planned uh, um, sagittal alignment targets. Uh, you see also uh, on the left is the planned uh, patient-specific rod that's being created. Um, uh, for my pelvic instance, 41 degrees. I'm going to end up with a thoracic kyphosis around 46 degrees is my plan. And then the lumbar lordosis is going to decrease from 51 to 43. Again, it's hyperlordotic now in its uh, response to the thoracic hyperkyphosis above. Obviously, uh, it's going to be a little bit of work to correct this. So, um, and I'm, I'm going to highlight this. I'm not going to use the uh, patient specific rod for correction. I'm going to use it as a holding rod once I correct with the um, uh, 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 temporary rods for the VCR and some other posterior column osteotomies performed above and below the VCR. But again, the ultimate rod is going to be a holding rod. Then it's going to uh, confirm that I've met my SAG alignment targets once I correct to the SAG alignment that I want from uh, T1 to the sacrum ilium. And I can drop this patient specific rod in as a uh, documentation that I've met my uh, SAG alignment targets in the thoracic, lumbar, or lumbar sacral region. So here's the uh, pre and post op x rays and the coronal plane, obviously, uh, kept nice and uh, Line in the sagittal plane, you see the marked correction uh, for, uh, with the T1 the sacrum construct. Uh, so again, 42 degrees of thoracic kyphosis. Uh, got a, a little bit more correction, a few more degrees of correction in our plan, but again, very much in line with what we plan, and obviously very nice ultimate sagittal alignment uh, in the thoracic region and compensatory lumbar uh, lordosis as well in the, uh, down below. So just from these three cases, I think you can see that uh, some of the benefits from uh, my perspective are uh, you're really seeing again uh, from a surgical planning and intra-op confirmation of sagittal alignment uh, perspective that everything is documented. Uh, uh, again, uh, I'm, a very, I'm a very visual person, so seeing this pre-op, I mean, really helps me uh, get a feel for exactly how I want to look uh, post-op or instrument intra-op. And obviously having a, a patient-specific rod bent to the sagittal alignment that I want confirms when I drop that in uh, even if I've used uh, another, uh, the other side for as a correcting side, then I've confirmed that I've met my sag alignment targets on the uh, uh, contralateral side. Uh, one other benefit, actually, that is true even for me, I've been in practice for a while, is that I understand exactly what the actual measurements look like in a prebent rod. I mean, I could probably get pretty close to seeing what the you know 36 degrees of thoracic kyphosis would be in a in a prebent rod. But I mean, I probably wouldn't be perfect with that. But now, obviously, you you know exactly what the amount of sagittal alignment to thoracic kyphosis above and lumbar lordosis below is in the rod. And that's a, a big benefit. Obviously, as I mentioned, you can confirm your sagittal alignment targets are met by placing the pre-contour rod into the screw heads with minimal additional contouring during the surgery. So it confirms you've met your targets. Obviously, I still get x-rays intra-op to confirm that as well, but uh, it's a nice feeling to know that this pre-bent rod is just dropped into place. 
Uh, one thing uh, that I've noticed, and that's it's a benefit for producing thoracic kyphosis, but you need to be aware of, is that the 6.0 millimeter colon compressor unit rod is much stiffer than an inside to bent Solera 6.0 millimeter rod. In other words, there's less deflection. So in other words, if I, if I wanted to take that first case and create 36 degrees of thoracic kyphosis starting out from 17 degrees, I'd probably have to bend about 50 or 55 degrees of kyphosis in, in the Solera rod, and it's going to give way to end up at 35 degrees or so. But in the uh, unit rod, it's, again, it's much different. The pre-bent rod also deflects less. So again, I, I have it bent probably six to eight degrees more than I, I want to end up with and not uh, 15, 20 degrees. So yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's a benefit um, when you're looking at uh, things like this when you're producing kyphosis. Another benefit obviously is that when um, uh, notching the rod less uh, in a pre-bent rod, so it should last longer to failure. Um, um, uh, because again, during a when you're multiple, as we know, we put multiple notches in a rod, it's going to fatigue sooner. And so the pre bent rod is much better for that. And that's maybe why in the study I showed from the ISSG, there was less rod failure. From that simple reason alone, that there's less to, uh, the fatigue life of the rod is going to be much higher. The feedback loop of this adaptive technology is useful. Again, for your future cases, I said that the platform learns how much correction you obtain with various maneuvers such as PCOs, T lifts, PSOs, et cetera, and incorporates that into your future cases to get better uh, 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 prediction of what you're going to achieve. Also, again, this predicting of the unfused curves above the instrument contract is very unique and beneficial and should help uh, meet our goals to reduce PJK complications. So to me, overall, this is a really a win-win technology for adult and pediatric deformity surgery for those who uh, have extensive or lesser experience doing these kind of cases. But obviously at this point, there are some limitations from my perspective. You know, there will, there will ultimately be the C-spine alignment planning, but it's not currently part of the planning process, but obviously that needs to be part of our, our um, uh, planning, or not only for instrumentation, but also for spontaneous correction. Uh, TK is currently measured from T4 to T12 and not from T1 to T12, and it doesn't measure, measure maximum kyphosis on MK. So we need to think about that when we're planning. And as I mentioned, the, the uh, unit rod is stiffer than a, than a, than a inside to bent Solera 6.0 moment rod. So you got to be a little careful in osteoporotic bone because uh, it's going to basically have a tendency to potentially pull out screws a little quicker uh, than the um, uh, Solera rod will. So it's a little stiffer. I think to me, that's ultimately an advantage, but you just need to be aware of that it is a stiffer rod inherently than the uh, Solera rod. Also, uh, again, the current limitation I mentioned uh, for my larger curves, I'm going to show you an example. I really still like to correct with uh, straight rods or rods that I contour and then use the uh, unit rod as more of a, a contralateral drop in rod. Uh, because especially when you have larger thoracic lumbar or lumbar scoliosis cases, when you're fixing the sacrum pelvis, again, I have a technique I like to correct for optimal um, uh, correction of sagittal and coronal plane and actual plane as well, actually, for uh, for curves in the lumbar sacral region going up to the proximal thoracic region. I'll show you an example of that. But my main correction method, again, for the sacrum pelvis includes a correction rod and then a holding rod, and the pre-op templated rod needs to be adjusted for that and will take time to automate, although I'm getting kind of better in that in the yeah, even today, actually, I put in a prevent rod as a, um, a permanent rod as a correction rod. So I'm getting kind of used to that they need. But for so many years, I used, I obviously had straight rods that I that I used as correcting rods. So I'm getting used to now using the prevent rods as correcting rods. It's a little bit different technique for me, but I'm slowly getting used to that. And as you'll see, uh, I'll show an example. Obviously, for, for really severe uh, kind of exotic deformity cases that uh, uh, we still can't use this the technology for that, maybe someday, but not yet. But I wanted to do a really quick here before show again a, a very um, uh, a common pathology that I treat an adult idiopathic scoliosis uh, patient uh, in her, in her uh, upper 50s. Uh, she's got some concave lumbar circle fractional stenosis. She's got a progressive thoracic lumbar deformity with back pain. She's got a thoracal, thoracic thoracic lumbar kyphosis. Uh, so, again, I want to correct all this uh, during my uh, posterior reconstruction. Uh, supine images are going to actually look at the spine images in the coronal sagittal plane to see the inherent flexibility of the spine. Again, there, are, there is some correctability, but it's pretty stiff. You see in all, all regions of the spine in both the coronal and sagittal plane. So, again, how do we correct uh, and what is the sequence of correction? Again, uh, my um, sequence of correction when I'm, when I'm fixing to the sacrum and pelvis, I go from bottom up. So, I'm going to correct the lumbosacral fractional curve first, then the thoracolumbar curve second the main thoracic curve third and the proximal thoracic region last. 
So again, how do I start the lumbar sacral region? Well, I'm going to take my right-sided rod. I'm going to bend lordosis in the rod. I'm going to engage it into the uh, S2I iliac screw, uh, S1, and I'm going to grab L5, L4, and L3 with reduction screws, and I'm going to compress L5 into S1, compress L4 into L5, and compress L3 into L4. So that's going to simultaneously create more distal lordosis and also horizontalize L5, L4, and L3. Then I'm going to stop. The rod's still hanging up in the air. I'm leave it alone, and I'm going to the contralateral side. On the left, I'm going to bend lordosis in that rod and, and again, engage the sacral pelvic fixation with either iliac or S2I screw, and then, then I'm going to capture S1. But I'm going to distract on this side. My sagittal plane is already locked in on the contralateral side, so I, I'm going to distract L5 and S1, L4 and L5, and L3 and L4, with the goal being to horizontalize L3. And I'll go back and forth. I'll go back to the right side, compress again from L3 to S1, and then go back to the left and distract again. So once you lock in the sagittal plane on one side, you don't take away lordosis on the other side. So uh, so that's my goal. So now the lumbar sacral curve is corrected. L3 is horizontalized. Now my next maneuver is to correct the thoracolumbar lumbar region. I'm going to do that now with the left-sided rod with a cantilever correction. So I'm going to push and cantilever that left-sided rod and the convexity of the thoracolumbar lumbar curve. I'm going to put that, push that curve ventral medialize it and also then compress it uh, with the screws again for additional correction. So that's my correction of the um, uh, thoracolumbar lumbar curve initially is a convex cantilever correction and compression towards the uh, apex of that curve. And then uh, after that, I'm gonna grab uh, with the right side of rod, the concave apical reduction screws and pull that uh, apex over more uh, medially. If I can't get it all uh, corrected, then I'll stop and I'll, um, and I'll save some of the most apical screws for uh, a uh, additional straight rod uh, uh, placed medial to the right sided rod is one of my additional support rods. This is going to be a four rod construct for the thoracal lumbar and lumbar sickle region. But that's my fourth uh, correction mover. Now for the main thoracic region, that's kyphotic. So I'm now I'm going to cantilever the right-sided rod because that's the convexity of the main thoracic curve. I'm going to cantilever and compress that side to, to get to take away kyphosis and push the thoracic main thoracic apex more eventual to correct the kyphosis. And then uh, on the sixth uh, correction is just to lay the top rod on the left uh, into the um, screw heads on the left to, uh, to be able to capture those and um, uh, impart some correction to optimize the proximal thoracic region as well. And then I lay in my two additional support rods. Again, uh, uh, either medial or lateral, depending on whether I've got full correction of the spine or not. Again, uh, in an offset position, I have my uh, contract go from uh, top to bottom, from two rods to three rods to four rods down to the sacrum and pelvis. So here's the final um, radiographs. Uh, again, after that correction maneuver, you see in the coronal plane, I've got nearly full correction of all three curves. Uh, you see with two uh, T lifts at the bottom and posterior column osteotomies uh, from T10 to sacrum. In the sagittal plane, you see I've corrected the thor thoracic hy hyperkyphosis and given more harmonious lumbar lordosis below you know, for a nice alignment overall. Again, as I mentioned, there's some cases like this 20 year old who's had 38 prior surgeries before coming to me that you know, we don't, unit, unit technology is not able to give us custom rods for this. So here's his Mark Coron sagittal malalignment. He actually wears a six inch shoe lift just to be able to uh, support his functional leg length and quality from a severe coronal malalignment as well as a sagittal malalignment. So he has a very complicated revision surgery with an L3 BCR, PCOs, and you see uh, multiple kickstand constructs on the right side to push his hemi pelvis down and try and realign him in the coronal sagittal planes, getting him from a six inch to a, a half inch shoe lift on the right with mark, markedly improved coronal sagittal line. Again, there's no way to have unit technology give us custom rods for this yet, but someday in the future. Conclusion again, this platform is, to me, there's really disruptive technology that will leverage big radiographic data with predictive analytics to assist with pre-op planning, intra-op execution, and post-op confirmation of sad alignment goals. And this type of educational process really inherent to this ecosystem should be strongly encouraged to be used really by everyone, all not only trainees and surgeons, but even experienced surgeons will benefit from this. So this and other similar AI um, and predictive modeling platforms are really the beginning of the new era of spinal deformity surgery. It's a bright future. Thank you for your attention.